Grace and Peace United Church and welcome to worship this Sunday morning. Once again, we are meeting in the church and uh, you're welcome to come down and join us. We're well below the COVID protocols in terms of attendance, so you're welcome to come any Sunday and join us there. A few things happening in the near future. We'll be having a golf day on the 18th of November. If you'd like to be involved, please get hold of the church office or Brian Shepherd and Mark uh, Philp and Carol Fenikak are, enjoying, are organizing it with them and others. So if you'd like to be part of it, just get hold of us uh, at the church office. And thank you to all of those who are involved in organizing it. It's the first time we'll be running it properly again. So then uh, once we've done the golf day, we'll be having a prayer walk on the 21st of November. And the prayer walk runs, goes from Philubic Street Church to the Kaimandi Chapel. And uh, it'll be a longish walk. We'll tell you more about it in, details, in, in detail in the future. But if you'd like to join us for a prayer walk, it's, we won't be praying the whole way, a lot of talking, a lot of discovering our, each other's stories, an opportunity to meet some of our members from the Kalmandi Chapel. If you're from Fenrubic Street and if you're at Kalmandi Chapel, to come and spend some time at the Fenrubic Street uh, part of the church. So come and join us, prayer walk, um, bring your walking shoes. It's after the 9.30 service on the 21st. And then on the 28th, we're going to have a bumper service. We're going to have a, a spring uh, flower festival. I know it's not quite it's a little bit of summer by then. But bring along an arrangement of flowers on the 27th to adorn the sanctuary. We'll be having Thanksgiving service along with an All Saints kind of day service to give thanks for those who have gone home to be with the Lord. We'll also be um, having a general Thanksgiving day, thanking the Lord for the way he's worked with us with a Thanksgiving offering. If you'd like to give a special offering on that day, that is the day. And then we'll also be doing something rather special, and that's saying goodbye to Wilhelmina who has been looking after us at our premises for uh, a long, long time now, nearly 40 years. So she remembers Jimmy and Norma Stevenson and their family uh, from long, long ago and has worked with David and then with me for a few years. So come and say goodbye to Wilhelmina. She'll be retiring that day. She's, uh, we've got a gift for her. And if you'd like to make a contribution to a special gift, just put it in our bank account with the uh, reference Wilhelmina and we'll make sure it gets to her. Then... Um, we're also, um, well, I'm looking forward to some long leave and sabbatical over December and January. We've got some great preachers coming to share with us over that time. So please don't lose heart, don't lose touch, uh, just keep in touch with us and um, continue to worship. And I will see you after the 29th of, November, uh, 29th of November, I'll see you again in January. But as we come to this text on the 10 bridesmaids, uh, another one of Jesus' parables, let's come to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray together. Holy Father, we thank you that you have given us these pithy, powerful stories through your son Jesus to lead us and guide us in our journey with you and to help us find what is priority in terms of the kingdom. Father, we pray for all of our families and our community that we would discover together on, an, on this journey the beauty of the love of Christ Jesus, the ability to serve one another, and that we would have our minds opened to the fullness of what it means to receive the love of God and to come home so that we would experience as a community, as an ever-increasing community, the generous and lavish love of God in Christ Jesus. And so speak to us through the word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Bible reading comes from Matthew 25, verse 1 to 13, the parable of the ten virgins. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they reply, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. 
but while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. And this ends our reading for today with praise and thank our Lord for his word. May the words of our mouths, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. I've read and listened to lots of sermons on the ten bride, bridesmaids, and I'm always troubled by the classic interpretations, the classic missionary interpretations of this text. And coming on the back of George Martinkowski's sermon last week, which I still haven't watched on YouTube, but I've heard a lot about from our members um, who have recited to me the various things that George spoke about. Most powerful for me has been the question, why would God, as a sower, sow wastefully? And I love this image that the seed is scattered everywhere and it's continually and profusely and widely scattered and some take root. This idea that God is lavish in giving away his love and so we should be too. And as I consider this message of grace, which is the, the overriding and cons consistent message of Jesus, the preaching of this 10 bridesmaids passage in the classical evangelical preaching has troubled me. The context of this text does tend to lend itself towards thinking about the end times, something that's been preached on a lot during the lockdown period. Um, end times meaning the eschaton, the end of the world, those times when Jesus will come again or the time approaching when Jesus will come again. And the, the beginning of chapter 24, the chapter before where we read today, Jesus comes out of the temple with his disciples, the disciples turn and, and point out the beauty of this Herodian temple and uh, the gold and the ivory and all the beauty of the architecture. And uh, well, no one could miss it, this beauty. But Jesus says, you see all of these, I tell you the truth, not one stone will be left on another. Now, Tom Wright comments that this is the most provocative teaching of Jesus, the teaching of the destruction of the temple. And uh, because in the Gospel of John, it follows Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, he puts it as the event which sparks his crucifixion, which secures his crucifixion in the minds of the Jewish leaders. But this is how this text begins, Matthew 24, the destruction of the temple. It's, we've got to keep that in mind, the temple and all that it represents as we come to the ten uh, bridesmaids. And then he goes on to talk about the signs of the end, end of the age, this moon, uh, blood moon, and uh, the, uh, the wars and rumors of wars, which are all the birth pangs, all the beginnings of the birth pangs. And he talks about persecutions, warning that Christians, not only Christians, but Jews in those days would be persecuted. Those who persevere would be saved, um, very much reminiscent of the Revelation uh, teachings. He then goes to talk about the desolation, the, the desolation of the temple, the abomination entering the temple, and this need as Jews to flee, to get away when this happens. Remember, Jesus is speaking to Jews at this point, the disciples, all Jews themselves. And uh, he's saying, pray that it will not be winter and that you will escape um, with your lives. And then he says, after all of the suffering, the Son of Man will come. So you can hear the murmurings of, of the end. But he begins to speak about watchfulness. And what does watchfulness mean? What does it mean to be watchful as a Christian? And uh, after having spoken about watchfulness in chapter 24, he goes on to this profound and obscure parable, the ten bridesmaids. Now, the classic way in which it is 
preached is there are these ten bridesmaids, five foolish, five wise. The wise take oil, the foolish don't. The bride's bridegroom is delayed and the bridesmaids wake up. The five wise ones realize they have enough oil. Those who are foolish do not have enough oil. And the foolish virgins um, or bridesmaids then go off to look for or buy oil, having been refused alone by the other five. And because they've gone off to look for oil, they then miss the cutoff. This door is shut and they come back and the master of the ceremony says, I do not know you. Now, we've heard all sorts of cultural interpretations about weddings, about how the lamp would be necessary to be able to walk with the bridegroom, light his way, to enter the feast, to be seen as one of the, the, um, the guests of the feast. And these bridesmaids are here with their, their lamps. And the, the foolish ones, the messages to the foolish ones classically preached, get it together, wake up, be prepared, watch out for the bridegroom will come when you least expect it. So this command seems classically to be given, just make sure you've got enough oil. Some interpreters talk about the oil being the Holy Spirit, make sure you have the Holy Spirit. But I, I just have so many difficulties with this. Remember the parables illustrate the kingdom of God. They're about the kingdom of God, or in Matthew, the kingdom of heaven, it means the same thing. Jesus came preaching in Matthew, repent for the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is near. And when he comes preaching this, he then works into his teaching all of these parables. And parables are essentially a pithy story aimed at illustrating one aspect of the kingdom of God. We cannot take all the aspects and then allegorize them as many have, um, making various things mean different things. Jesus wants to illustrate one simple thing about it. Now, why is it that Jesus, having, having taught constantly about follow me, come to me, all who receive and believe will inherit eternal life, that, that you, you come not on the basis of what you have done, but on the basis of faith to Christ Jesus to receive and accept him. And the book of Romans is strong on this. We are saved by grace through faith. It is not by works that we are saved. And yet the interpretation of this parable is so often given that it, there is some thing that we need to do in order to ensure that we're in the wedding banquet. We have to be careful to make sure that we have this thing or that we have done this thing and we're prepared in order to be in the wedding banquet. I, I love that we, we want to challenge ourselves constantly and that preachers do challenge us to be prepared, to be awake, to be, to be ready. But I'm not sure that Jesus wants to present, in fact, I'm sure he doesn't want to present at this point, another requirement for entrance into the kingdom of God. When Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, the word repent is an ancient Jewish word used by the prophets of, uh, on, about the exile of, of Israel to Babylon, saying to Israel, come home, repent, come home. The word essentially means to come back. And when Isaiah preaches that the remnant will return and Jeremiah promises that the people of God will return to the promised land, the word used of return is this word shuv or yashuv, to return. And the, the, the people returning home is repentance. In fact, we 20th, 20th century and 21st century preachers have used the word repent to mean to put away sin, to stop sinning. An impossibility if you, if you really accept the, the doctrine of, of sin and brokenness in humanity. And, and so when Jesus says repent, he, he really means come home. The, the prodigal son parable, come home the father, just come home and be embraced by the father. So with all of this in mind, I struggle with the idea that there is an ought in this parable, that Jesus is saying there's one thing you need to do in order to get into the feast, or you will simply be shut out. So I want to look at this under the, ba the banners of the three categories we've looked at, the other parables under. The first one is that they are expressing an eternal truth and not a temporal truth, eternal or infinite God-centered truth 
not a truth of this world. Secondly, that they invite all to come, as John 3.16, for God so loved the world that everyone, all who believe, will receive eternal life, that they're inclusive of all. And thirdly, that it is about serving, not Jesus crying over Jerusalem and wanting all to come to him. So the first thing is eternal. This idea that the door will be shut. We need to be careful when we read the parables to take every image, a shut door or a master or um, a late bridegroom or all of these images as being uh, the story for about the kingdom of God. Um, the, these are temporal images which Jesus uses to express an eternal truth. And when we make too much of them, we limit the message when we make them stand front and center. For this parable is about the king and his kingdom. The kingdom is like. And um, when we consider the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and how it applies to us through his death, for there to be a, a harshness about it, and rather, rather than an invitation, or a requirement of people to behave or, or, or do something specific, which is almost akin to a sacrifice, it, it detracts from the power of the death and resurrec resurrection of Jesus to accomplish our salvation. And so the eternal truth about this is that there is a bridegroom who is coming and there is a kingdom which is a feast. It is a feast of a marriage between the, this bridegroom and his bride. Perhaps the, the best image for that is Ephesians chapter 5 where Jesus speaks about, uh, where Paul speaks about Jesus and the church being in a marriage. Jesus and his people being in a marriage. So the eternal truth is that there is this bridegroom, he's coming and he's coming to a, a marriage and there is this feast, this joyous feast, which is to happen. Um, and he's wanting to express an eternal truth. And he uses these, these bridesmaids to express it. But the second thing is that it's inclusive. It, the, these bridesmaids are welcome. All of them, all ten of them are welcome to join the feast. And they can simply come. The bridegroom is coming, we join the procession and we go on. But when we look at the context of this in the terms of Matthew 24 and the, the, the prediction or the prophecies, prophecy always has more than one component. And the most immediate component of Jesus' prophecies in chapter 24 is the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. It will be destroyed 70 AD. Historians even tell us that the, the looters of the temple tore it apart to try and get the gold which had burnt and melted inside the stones tore it apart, leaving one stone upon another in 70 AD. When Jesus looks forward to the abomination that causes desolation, it is the Roman destruction of the temple in response to revolts of the Israeli, Israelite people in the first century. And Jesus looks forward to it as a time of destruction when smoke will fill the heavens and all the, the sun and the moon will just go red because of this the smoke. And that's the immediate prophecy. Now, the context of this again is the church leaders. Jesus in, in chapter 23 uh, preaches the woes, the, the seven woes, where he castigates the, 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 the Pharisees, the scribes, the teachers of the law for being hypocrites, for speaking and having a law and then not following it in terms of the grace which God shows for Israel is called to be a blessing to others. And they are burdening the people of God so heavily that they're unable to fulfill the requirements to be included in the feast of the bride, bridegroom. What Jesus says to them is, no, this is a feast to which all are invited. The bridemaids are just welcome. But if they're welcome, where do they get it wrong? And how are these five, in a sense, excluded from the feast? And um, we've got to ask the question with many commentators who've asked us, why is it when these five who don't have oil ask the others, um, for oil, they don't give them any. Well, I'm not really sure. Um, I don't think the parable is trying to teach us generosity at any level. I don't think that's the point of it. But perhaps the real point of this, the oil is the, the thing, isn't it? It's the thing that takes the, these bride, bridesmaids away, is that it's not about the oil. The oil is the thing, but it's not about the oil. Let me explain that. You see, the five bridesmaids that have oil simply get up and go with the bridegroom into the feast. They go into the kingdom, they enjoy the benefits, the beauty, the, the, the fullness of the feast of God in the kingdom with the bridegroom. But the others make it all about the oil. Instead of it being about the bridegroom, it becomes about the oil. 
It becomes once again for them about the requirements, the requirements of the law. What is the law? What are the customs in those days that the bride, bridesmaids should have oil? And in the same way as Jesus, Jesus just before this has, has reprimanded the Pharisees and the, the, the teachers of the law for, for burdening people with extra requirements in order to receive the love and grace of God. Jesus now says of these five bridesmaids, well, they've been like the Pharisees. What they've done is they've run after requirements rather than running after the bridegroom. What is the important thing about this marriage? The important one is the bridegroom, and they've made it about the oil. And the reason they've missed this feast is because they've run after the Torah. They've run after the law. The oil is something that distracts them from their primary business, which is to attend the attend to the bridegroom. Now, the kingdom of God is about service. And if Jesus comes to serve, and we are to be servants of Jesus, then no amount of pride or requirement to be ready in the sense of being having enough oil or having done any particular thing that is good in order to enter the feast should separate us from the service of the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. Let's not be distracted by the oil in our lives, those things which we think we ought to do before we can be ready for service of the King or to enter into the banquet of the marriage of the King. Whatever it is in your life that you think is not good enough to enter that banquet, it doesn't count. It's not about the oil. If there is something in your, even in your personality or character, which you think separates you from the kingdom of God and from which you need to depart in order to enter the kingdom of God, it's not about the oil. God receives you. Get up, follow the bridegroom and enter the kingdom. The idea, the very notion that there is any requirement of any human being to do something or change something before they can enter the kingdom of God, is foreign to the grace that comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ. For all who receive and believe, receive eternal life. And that receiving and believing is not finding oil for your lamp. It is simply getting up and following the bridegroom into the feast. And I want to invite you today, if you've not done that in your mind, in your heart, in, in your prayers, to do it, to do it right now, because you don't need to do anything, but it's a good thing to have a conversation with the Lord and to ask him to help you, to help you into the future, to be with you through his spirit, to empower you to be the person that he wants you to be in his kingdom, to serve others, but most of all, to give you the guts to come without pride, without a sense that you need to change, without a sense that, well, the church is just not like me, but to come to the bridegroom and say, with or without oil, I'm here. I'm here just to be part of what you want to do in this world. And I want you to pray that today. Some people call this the sinner's prayer. Some people call it the prayer of acceptance of Jesus, um, the prayer of becoming a Christian. But if you haven't done it, come into the banquet of the, of the bridegroom, this feast where the bridegroom marries his bride, the church. So I invite you, come, let's pray together. Father, thank you that these images which have terrified us in this parable before, about shut doors and about angry masters, that Father, they're, they're just there to illustrate that we don't need the oil. We just need to come. We don't need to worry about the, the laws, changing ourselves, making some sort of resolution about being a different person. We just need to come and follow the bridegroom. And so, Lord Jesus, we know that you are the bridegroom who loves your church and you, who gives yourself up, who washes her and makes her perfect. And Father, we pray that for ourselves, that you would wash us and make us perfect, that nothing that we have or haven't done would impact our desire to serve you in this world and to just make it the kind of place that you want it to be, a kingdom of love, and a kingdom of peace. And so, Lord Jesus, we want to surrender to you. We want to follow you as the bridegroom, and we want to be part of this feast. May, may we not experience ourselves shut out, but may we be included. 
because you include us. And so, Father, we give ourselves to you. We give ourselves to you, Lord Jesus. And we pray that you would help us as we follow you in this kingdom to be the servants you want us to be, but to have a mind set free from the, the do's and don'ts and oughts and ought nots of this world into a place where everything is possible through you. Come, Lord Jesus, fill us with bucket loads of your Holy Spirit and empower us to be your people as you want us to be in this world. And along the way, just include so many others in the feast. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.